the Wade Center's podcast. The podcast of Wheaton College. The two Lewis brothers, Jack and Warren, were going off on a walking tour with Tolkien, but they were much more destination oriented. So they would like the tree and the flowers and the view, but they wanted to get to the next pub by lunch and then they wanted to get somewhere (laughs) Mm -hmm. in order to board for the evening. And Tolkien, the hiker, was just like Tolkien, the artist. He would stop and say, do you know what this flower is called? And he would go into the the derivation of that flower. And then he would stop and say, see this tree? It's really unusual this tree is growing here because normally willows don't like to grow. And they said he was such a dilatory walker, they finally dropped him off at George Sayers' house in (laughs) Malvern and said, could you entertain toddlers for a few days while Warren and I continue our walking tour? So basically, (laughs) they (laughs) <laughs> dropped him off and he was he was amenable he thought that was fine Welcome to the Wade Center podcast. Today, we are beginning a series on the work of J.R.R. Tolkien, much as we did on the Narnia Chronicles. So we thought a good way to get started with the conversation is with an extremely important short story that Tolkien wrote in 1938-1939 and then published in 1945 that tells us a lot about his thought process as an artist that will prepare us to understand Lord of the Rings. And this story is called Leaf by Niggle, which rhymes with giggle. But David, maybe you could explain the meaning of the significance of the word niggle and summarize it for people who have never read it before. Okay. Uh, Niggle means someone who pays excessive attention to detail. They get so caught up with the small things that they lose track of the the big picture. A niggler is someone who gets focused on minor details and, and can't stay focused on the larger part. The story was published in 1945. He wrote in a letter that usually his composition process was to go after revision after revision and do multiple drafts. But he wrote his publisher and said, I woke up one morning with a story in my mind and I wrote it down that afternoon. It's totally different from my normal composition process. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Which is ironic then in light of the content of the story. Exactly. Why don't you explain it? The one time he didn't niggle over details was writing a story called Leaf by Niggle. Yeah. Niggle is a painter who has a lot of civic duties and neighbors who have needs that they want him to address. His great love is he wants to draw a picture of a tree, a perfect picture of a tree where every leaf glistens. You can see the dew drops on the leaves. You can see the veins. But he is such a perfect that he spends more time just on one leaf than he does on the whole picture. Mm. And he's constantly interrupted. He has a neighbor named Parrish, P-A-R-I-S-H, who's constantly saying, my lumbago is acting up, which is lower back pain. My wife is sick. I need some help with this. Uh, I don't have a bicycle and you have a bicycle. He criticizes Nickel because he spends so much time on his painting Mm. of his leaf and then the tree that it is attached to that he doesn't tend his own garden. So there's weeds growing in his garden. He's just so obsessed with his artwork. Yes. And at one point, Parrish has a leak in his roof and he says, boy, if I just had some some boards and canvas, I could use that to cover the leak in my roof. And he looks longingly <laughs> at this painting, which is the great life project of Niggle. So kind-hearted, but begrudging. He goes and does these errands for other people. Parrish's wife is sick. And so he arranges for the doctor and he talks to a builder about mm-hmm. fixing the roof. But in doing so, he himself gets sick. Mm. Uh, I should mention the very first line is he had to go on a journey which is very similar to the first line of every man. Mm-hmm. And the journey yeah. is death. And so right away we know he wants to stay put where he is in this world, but he knows there's impending journey. Mm-hmm. It's actually very similar to the opening of Pilgrim's Regress by C.S. Lewis. Mm. Oh, okay. That you, and later on, he has to go through a wicket gate. That's a very important moment in Pilgrim's Regress when he has to go through the wicket gate, which is a narrow gate, which means you can't take your possessions with yeah. you. David, I was going to ask you before we get too much into the story, is this feels very allegorical. Mm-hmm. Like Mr. Parrish feels like his church parish and mm-hmm. there's a lot of right. that kind of going on. And then it also feels a little autobiographical. So we talked about that a couple episodes back about autobiography and allegory. Mm. And I think we mentioned this story. So can you kind of back up a little bit? Like, is this allegorical? How much 
how much is it trying to say something or is it a, you know, because Tolkien is very much about the story is supposed to be its own story. Right. And this feels very un-Tolkien in that way. Well, if this were a true-false test, I would say true and true. Okay. It's very unusual for Tolkien because he didn't like allegory. As you recall in the preface to Lord of the Rings, he says, I dislike allegory in all its forms. I prefer mm-hmm. history, whether true or feigned. But here's a story which is unapologetically allegorical yeah. and autobiographical. Yeah. So you write about both of those accounts. It becomes especially clear when he goes to the hospital and he hears yeah. these two voices. And then he's allowed to go to a garden. Let me continue with the story. But yes, this okay. is a kind of self-portrait. Yeah, yeah. We talk about book ideas uh, for our listeners or dissertation ideas. Mm-hmm. A great book that someone should write is Portrait of the Artist by the Artist in Their Art. Oh, okay. This is in many ways a self-portrait. It's kind of a uh, self-effacing self-portrait. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah. kind of making fun of himself. Mm-hmm. Um, you could throw in The Artist of the Beautiful by Hawthorne, The Hunger Artist by Kafka. Portrait maybe, of an Artist as a Young Man. Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man, definitely. Okay. James that Joyce. would be the classic one. You might even throw in Old Man in the Sea by Hemingway. Oh, maybe okay. going out to chase the, the big fish is the artist trying to come up with their ultimate artistic idea and not succeeding. Huh. So this would be a chapter seven in our book on uh, artists portraying the okay. artist in their art. <laughs> David, is this a book you have later? Uh, it should be, yeah. Okay. It, right. would, it would be a fun class to teach. It would yeah. be a seminar to teach. Yeah, definitely. Well, and if we're going to talk about the autobiographical elements as Tolkien presents Niggle and the opening line you're referring to, he says, there was once a little man called Niggle, who had a long journey to make. And Mm. so he is setting it up almost like a fairy tale. Mm. Once upon a time, there was once a little man, and he refers to him as a little man throughout the whole story, Yeah, which is kind of interesting because Tolkien was... Rather short and yeah, stature. Yeah, oh, he really? was a little man really? he as was? well. Yeah, He's about 5'7", five, 5'8", five, when most of his friends were a few inches taller. Right. Oh. In fact, if you come to the Wade Center, we have the desk upon mm. which Tolkien wrote much of Lord of the Rings. And what everybody says when they look at it, it's they say it's such a little desk. Yeah, and it's this, like a hobbit desk. Yeah, yeah this Especially little, compared to Lewis's desk. Yeah, right, right <laughs> which we have right next to it. So you, you can make that comparison. In the drawer, we should put a beautiful drawing of a leaf. Just throw it in a Aww. drawer. Oh, that that's a good idea. <laughs> oh, we have to do oh, that. Where does this come from? But what I love about your summary so far, and then we'll get to a continuation of it, is if Tolkien is presenting an autobiographical allegory, Mm -hmm. as it were, and how all he wants to do is work on his great art, which everybody says was true. He just loved tinkering with Lord of the Rings. Yeah, with innumerable over branches. over and over right. and over and over. Rewrites, rewrites. Even when his publishers would send the final galleys, which you're only supposed to check if there's mistakes. Mm-hmm. And then he would cross out whole paragraphs and say, oh, I think I'm going to change what happened here. You know, <laughs> the publishers are just, no, no, we've already, you know, set this in type. You can't start changing the galleys. But what I love about this story is as he presents the obsessions of Nigel with doing his art, he does recognize you have to serve humanity. So when Parrish asks him to do things, but what is illuminating and very convicting to me is that he would go ahead and do what he knew he wanted to do, but he resented it. Yeah, he said things under his breath. And, right. Yeah. He didn't want to do it. He his, considered it a nuisance. Yes, a nuisance. And that comes right in the opening pages. Yeah. That he resented nuisances and hindrances. And I just felt so convicted because when I'm in the middle of a writing project, I'm the same way. Mm. I realize, oh, this is my job. I better take care of this issue. Oh, this person needs me. But I kind of resent it inside. Mm. And I am not fulfilling the spirit of Christ. What is that famous line by C.S. Lewis, David, about hindrances? Is that from? Well, we we talked about screw tape letters, how people so resent interruptions. They think all their time is their own. Yes. And when anybody else imposes on their time, they feel, well, this is an interruption. This isn't fair. And screw tape says this attitude is equally funny in heaven and hell. (laughs) 
Uh, <laughs> the idea, he says, none of us made time or can control time. Yeah. Yeah, I think when we did that, we all three felt yes, convicted very by much the so. idea that this is an interruption on my real time. Yeah, this is my mm, time. Yeah. Right. I find psychologically, though, go ahead and do the work and then grumble about it. I think that's very helpful. <laughs> to, <laughs> I'm not ready to, I'm not ready to, to abandon that strategy. Huh. Yeah. Well, and another reinforcement for autobiographical allegory is Tolkien actually had a drawing himself of a tree that he called the Tree of Amalion. Mm-hmm. Is that how you pronounce it? It's an elvish word. It means okay. tree of blessing. Oh, okay. And he kept drawing it over the years from 1928 until 1972. Oh, wow. So he kind of is like Nickel who, and who keeps mm. paying attention to this great work of art. And that correlates with a, a line in this story insofar as Tolkien described the tree of Amalion as bearing various shapes of leaves, many flowers, small and large, signifying poems and major legends. Then in the story... And this I is a to- podcast, so we can't visualize it, but he has beautiful drawings of the tree of Amalion in the, the book uh, called The Art of Tolkien. Oh, so yeah. if the, the um, listeners would just bear with me, I'm going to draw in the air. Okay, here's a trunk. <laughs> Each tree has completely different blossom. One is small and delicate. Yeah. And on the next branch is this beautiful, but you flourishing... Could, you guys can't go Google it. You're in, probably near a... Yeah, you, uh, yeah. yeah Google yes. the tree of Amalion. Uh, I thought my verbal description was probably adequate. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. But he, even in the story, will talk about the passages of his painting. And that word passages, Mm. you usually associate with literature, of course, working on a passage of literature. So that reinforces this sense of basically what Tolkien wanted to do was work on Lord of the Rings and or Silmarillion. And he would get these interruptions and... He had to grade papers and students wanted to talk to him and he had to serve on committees and all those annoying elements of life. Yeah. And so he's pouring himself out into this story to talk about this desire to just dedicate his life to Lord of the Rings. Although ironically, Lewis thought that he kind of enjoyed college politics. Oh, really? Uh, Lewis called Tolkien. Tolkien enjoyed college politics. Yeah, Lewis called Tolkien the Lord of the Strings. (laughs) <laughs> he liked kind of promoting his allies and putting down his oh, wow. his enemies. But yes, in general, he had four children to raise. Uh, his wife felt that he didn't spend enough time at home with the family. Oh. He was, and uh, some of his colleagues felt he wasn't doing enough academic scholarship. After he finished Lord of the Rings, he made a real effort to publish a number of academic articles because uh, he felt that they were judging him for spending too much time on his private hobby oh, wow. rather than upon his, his uh, scholarly work. Well, he does mention that Niggle, uh, Niggle at one point says he wishes that he could have a pension so right. he could just right. work on the painting. And I did also find it interesting that even though it is autobiographical, Niggle is not married and he doesn't have kids in the story. Right. And so uh, I, I, I would be, that would be like a, a job for a psychiatrist to sit down and have that conversation yeah. with Tolkien. But he does have a bicycle. Uh, Tolkien, <laughs> Tolkien loved his bicycle. He would bicycle into work in his academic regalia. And uh, <clears throat> when he took his sons to Mass, they would all bicycle together down to the, uh, to the Mass. Uh. Yeah, that is interesting, but I think parish represents in the old English communities, parish is the whole town. Right. You know, so not your just family, the church. your community, right. the church. Yeah, when t- being on the parish means you're being supported by the church. Gotcha. So it's a great symbol of all of your external responsibilities in life. I think there's a part of Tolkien that would have just preferred to be a priest and just spend all day in his cell working on writing and painting and, and studying and not having to mm-hmm. do any external commitments. Kind of like a a medieval priest who was doing illuminated manuscripts and that that was your entire job. You didn't have any responsibilities outside. You were just copying the Bible before the printing press was even invented. And laboring away at illustrations of, you know, weird random things in the margins. Yeah, (laughs) right. Which is what he loved to do. If you saw his, his home office, uh, it was kind of bland and dark and dusty, but right by his desk, there's a shelf of all kinds of colored paper and all kinds of oh. inks and mm. paints. And even when he was doing crosswords, he would make these beautiful doodles. Uh, they remind me of, uh, what are those kind of ties that have the little curvy 
Uh, they oh. were big in the 60s. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking Paisley. about. Paisley. Paisley. Yeah, he would do a lot of doodles in the crosswords, and he always finished the crossword puzzles. Uh-huh. They found all these ones after he died, and they're all completed. Oh, wow. So he had more trouble drawing a leaf than he did completing a crossword puzzle. Oh. Wow. Wow. Hmm. I also noticed uh, in the early section of the book, it keeps coming up that he just wishes that somebody would praise his picture. Right. He, right. you know, he he gets, you know, he gets complaints or offers to help about things, and what he really wants is for somebody to praise mm. his right. picture and recognize the beauty of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it made me wonder if Tolkien kind of wished, you know, or felt like nobody really recognized what he was mm-hmm. doing with Lord of the Rings. I think mm. so. He he said that the main thing that Lewis gave him for Lord of the Rings was sheer encouragement. Mm. Lewis kept saying, this is really good. It needs to be published. You need to finish it. Mm. Uh, some obtuse critics say that Parrish represents Lewis, but uh, that's a yeah. misreading because Lewis yeah, always yeah. loved and supported Tolkien's work. He was oh. his biggest fan. Yeah. It, whereas Parrish is kind of like, now, why do you keep bothering with mm-hmm. that painting? And couldn't I use that to fix my roof? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And it's not until they get later in the story. Yeah that Parrish starts realizing the beauty of a tree. Yeah. And uh, it actually, he starts getting into gardening. Uh, um, Niggle starts getting into tending his garden. So yeah. they almost switch roles. Mm. Well, let's get back to the story itself. Yeah. Uh, Although, let me insert right oh, here, sorry. this is still a Parrish's just dismissiveness of the art of Niggle is still a problem, especially among Protestants uh. who would just say, well, you know, someone who just wants to make art, you know, that that's a waste of time. There's people out there starving. There are so many needs in our culture. How could you just sit inside and work on yeah. pottery or a canvas? Yeah. And so this story also serves as a, a type of apologetic mm-hmm. by the end for the value of art, the value of beauty, because even at the end... The lasting value of art. Yes. Yeah. That that Parrish finally starts recognizing the beauty of what Nigel was doing. Well, this goes back to uh, Tolkien's whole theory of the artist, sub-creation. Right, Uh, right. God made real trees, but if you can make a painting of a tree which does honor to the real tree, you are honoring God. You're expressing the image of God in you. Once again, it reminds me a lot of a story by Hawthorne called The Artist of the Beautiful. The man is a mechanical genius, and his father-in-law wants him to make turbines and generators and new inventions. Mm -hmm. But he wants to create this perfect mechanical butterfly, which is colorful, but it can actually fly around the room. And he finally creates the perfect mechanical butterfly, and a little child sees it and swats it. (laughs) But the, the artist isn't upset because... Having accomplished what he wanted to, mm. it's okay that the physical butterfly isn't there. He just achieved his goal. Oh, wow. And mm. it's an interesting contrast to uh, Niggle, who keeps wanting to finish the whole tree. He's only gotten one good leaf, but he wants to do the tree and then the forest in the background. Yeah. Should we go on with the story a little bit? Yes. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. By the way, this story, you can read it one sitting. We're making it sound like Lord of the Rings Part 2. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Crystal just read it just now while we, during the podcast. <laughs> she just flipped through the whole thing. So uh, finally he does, he gets sick from uh, trying to help Parrish uh, fix his roof so that Parrish's wife won't be ill. And she recovers, but he doesn't. So a, a driver comes and says, well, it's time for your journey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is like the old uh, Darby McGill and the little people when the carriage shows up with black horses and says, Darby, Darby McGill, <laughs> get in. In this case, it was Niggle. So he starts off on his trip. He wakes up in a hospital. He hears these two voices talking about him. And he doesn't know if they're judges or doctors, or but there's some kind of two voices appraising his life. Yeah. And one voice is very critical. He was a little man. He didn't attend to his duties. He was too caught up in his hobby. And the second voice is kinder and gentler and says, but he, he really tried to help people, even though that wasn't his natural temperament. Yeah. And he really seemed to be working on something important. Uh, Tom Shippey, I think, is given the best overview of this story. Oh, yeah. Tolkien said in a letter that it was a, a purgatorial story. Gotcha. Yeah. Meaning that, I mean, he literally, as a Roman Catholic, believed that there would be a time of purgation after life where you got rid of the impurities before you were able to enter into the presence of God. Yeah. So the hospital seems to represent the first stage of purgatory. And the two voices 
seem to be justice and mercy. And justice is holding them up to very severe standards. He really didn't do nearly as much as he could have done for other people. Yeah. And mercy is, you know, for his temperament and for his obsession with his art, he actually, he did pretty well at trying to help others in, in the parish. Yeah. So I think that uh, Tom Shippey is, is correct that this is justice and mercy discussing their two kind of archangels mm. trying to decide where he is in his spiritual journey in purgatory. Well, and of course, there is a tradition that even precedes Dante where justice and mercy are arguing together. Oh, really? And it is based on Psalm 8510, which reads, Mercy and truth are met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. And as a result of that psalm, there was an 11th century Jewish midrash in which truth, justice, mercy, and peace were four standards surrounding the throne of God. And then, once again, before Dante, you have a tradition that developed into what is called the four daughters of God, who are truth, justice, mercy, and peace, who start arguing at the throne of God as to, should this person be allowed into heaven or not? Interesting. And one of the famous... uh, Every Man Stories, it's actually a play, Mm -hmm. early 1400s, um, that is called The Castle of Perseverance, is how it's always pronounced in England, Mm -hmm. where actually they put the four daughters of God on stage arguing in front of God. Interesting. So what Tolkien is doing is picking up on an ancient, ancient tradition that even precedes Dante about having justice and mercy. And both are legitimate, but it goes back to, basically, this is another story about both and, that both mercy and justice are part of our soul's journey. Yeah, they have a Mm -hmm. role to play in his sanctification. Exactly. There's, uh, I wanted to mention a line when he is getting sent off on his journey, he's told that he, you know, he has a bag, but he can't, he can take neither food nor clothes. And it reminded me of Jesus's commissioning, you know, where they're told, you know, to not take an extra tunic or extra sandals. So a lot of those kinds of biblical allusions just slipped in subtly throughout the, the story. And that also happens in Pilgrim's Progress. And doesn't he leave his bag behind in this story? Yes, yes. All your worldly possessions and securities have to be left behind. Right. But what's in his bag, he didn't take any food or clothes. What he put in his bag was art supplies. Yeah. <laughs> because food and clothes, I can get along without those, but it's my art that is important. And ultimately, he has to leave his art behind yeah. as well because well, his whole identity is in his art. Yeah, because when he gets to purgatory, he, he they just give him carpentry jobs. He's just right. nailing up boards and then he has to paint them white, you know, just different right. shades mm-hmm. of white, which to a painter is just like, you know, is purgatory. It's like right. just mm-hmm. different versions of white. There's no yeah. color. And then eventually after he's sanctified and he kind of learns his lesson and begins to be able to do things and leave them and then focus on other stuff, they give him digging as he's doing hard manual right. labor, you know. right. But what's significant about it, and this is something that a lot of Protestants miss insofar as they think, oh, the whole doctrine of purgatory is just how you have to work your way to heaven. But starting as early as Origen, he has an interesting view of purgatory that Dorothy Sayers, and of course, Dorothy Sayers interpreted Dante's Purgatorio for Penguin Books. And so she did a lot of writing about purgatory. Oh, yeah. And in the second century, Origen says, these souls um, receive in prison, and they actually refer to the hospital that Nichols in, call, he calls it, it was like a prison. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They These souls receive in prison, not the retribution of their folly. It's not punishment, Mm. not the retribution of their folly, but a benefaction in the purification from the evils contracted in that folly, a purification effected by the means of salutary troubles. In other words, this is for their own best interests. And Sayers gives an analogy that I really like and how I've kind of interpreted it is if a bride 
is ready to go down the aisle to meet her bridegroom and accidentally spills a glass of grape juice on her wedding dress. Mm-hmm. We will say in our language, she went to great pains in order to remove the stain mm. because she wanted to be, you know, this beautiful, pure vision when she went up the aisle to her bridegroom. Huh. That's the idea of purgatory that mm. we want to, we ourselves want to get rid of the stain in as we meet the bridegroom, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Lewis had a similar analogy. He said, if you were a street urchin and some said, would you like to meet the king? You would say, well, can I get rid of these old rags and get yeah, nice get clothes? get cleaned up. Yeah. 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 Can I get scrubbed? Well, that would hurt. You've got a lot of dirt. Well, even if it hurts, I'd rather be clean when I when I stand before the king. Yeah. They both were attracted to the doctrine of purgatory. Right. Now, right. as a podcast of Wheaton College, we do not subscribe to the doctrine of purgatory. <laughs> no. But we're imaginatively no. But I'm just saying that that's... Some Protestants don't understand the real complexity of the whole idea. But unfortunately, it just gets reduced to, oh, you just have to legalistically work your way to heaven, which is not what the doctrine of purgatory is about. It's helpful to understand what the actual doctrine is, what people believe. If you're going to reject it, that's fine. But you should at least, you know, exactly. understand what the people you disagree exactly. with think as opposed right. to setting up a straw man, you know. Yeah. Right. I wish we had our friend Holly Ordway here. She's writing a book on the importance of uh, Tolkien's Roman Catholic faith to his writings. And she would be a great resource to right. talk about how well, the Well, doctrine... we will talk to her someday yeah. okay. once she finishes her well, book. Can I read a short little passage where he is sanctified? And I think it's helpful to understand it in the context of what his problem was on earth and then in purgatory, how he's sanctified. Uh, He's getting better by some odd medical standard. uh, And then he says that it could not be denied that he began to have a feeling of well satisfaction, bread rather than jam. He could take up a task the moment one bell rang and lay it aside promptly the moment the next one went all tidy and ready to be continued at the right time. He got through quite a lot in a day now. He finished small things off neatly. And he goes on to talk about it. And he says, there was no sense of rush. He was quieter inside now. And at resting time, he could really rest. Mm. And so there's this sense that Niggle goes from being this person on earth who obsesses about leaves and doesn't get things done. And there's weeds growing in his garden. And he Mm -hmm. just can't be organized and productive because all he can focus on is dreaming about this tree and painting these leaves. To in purgatory, he's able to do small tasks. And when they call him to fix something, he fixes it and then he lays it aside and he doesn't think about it anymore and so he's being improved in a way yes to be a his better version of himself changing. yes right. and he didn't know how to order his life that's once again i think that there's a funny autobiographical element there lewis called uh, tolkien he said he's a genius but he's a dilatory unmethodical man mm. <laughs> and i think that tolkien himself felt wouldn't it be great to go to purgatory and to learn to order my life and to get things done yeah. and to rest at night because I didn't have all these duties pressing on me. When he finally leaves the hospital part of purgatory, he says, how's my old friend Parrish? How's he doing? I, I kind of mm. worry about him. Uh, in some ways, they were neighbors, but they weren't exactly friends because Parrish didn't appreciate what he was doing with his painting. Yeah. And he considered Parrish to be an imposition. But it's interesting when he shows some concern about someone else, the two voices, uh, Justice and Mercy, say, Hmm, I think maybe he's ready to be checked out of the hospital. Maybe it's yeah. time to put him. Mm. So when he shows actual compassion, for, what'd you call them? The four daughters of God, truth, justice, mercy, and peace. Huh. And I, peace and mercy are kind of arguing against truth and justice because uh, the truth part is, hey, this is true. These are his sins. You have to acknowledge your sins. Yeah, yeah. But then one of them mentions that he, um, you know, he did the he did do these things for Parish and for others, and he he never expected any return. And then they talk about his uh, yes. his bike ride in the rain when he gets sick as, right. a, as a genuine sacrifice because he didn't really think that Harris's wife was all that sick and mm-hmm. all that it wasn't all that important. And so they do sort of they did they do point out the good things in his life right. that he did. Now I did want to mention I had a friend in college who wanted to have three daughters and name them Shirley, Goodness, and Mercy. <laughs> So that would have been going on with the uh, tradition of the daughters. There. Well, that would well. put him in an awkward position. 
So here is one of Sayer's statements in her introduction to, to her translation of Dante's Purgatorio, which totally aligns with what um, we've been talking about. Purgatory is not a system of divine bookkeeping, so many years for so much sin, but a process of spiritual improvement which is, which is completed precisely when it is complete. And then she quotes Charles Williams, who says, God is satisfied when we are satisfied. Mm. It's like, oh, I've finally gotten the stain out of my bride dress or the, the young little boy. Oh, urchin, I find yeah. urchin. I've finally cleaned up. I'm ready to meet the king. Yay. And that's a radically different way to view it. Yeah. Well, let's move on with the story. So he gets out of the hospital, yeah. partly because he showed compassion for Parrish. Gets on the train, a little bit unusual for Tolkien, because generally in all of his Middle Earth stories, there's no modern conveniences. Oh. This is another way in which this uh. story is, is unusual. We have bicycles, we have uh, a yeah, train, train station, yeah. that yeah. sort Good of thing. Point. Did uh, Tolkien like trains himself personally? Uh, I think we mentioned in an earlier one, he didn't travel as much as Lewis did around England. Oh, okay. Uh, but... He didn't say much about trains. Yeah, because he, he talks about it very fondly. He talks about a delicious smell of tar or something, and everything's new. And he, he just seems very, um, pra- you know, he praises the train and right. the look of it. Well, I know he had an automobile for a while because he got very impatient with pedestrian traffic. <laughs> Sometimes he'd wait a while, and then he'd just honk and go ahead. And he'd say, you know, charge them, and they scatter like geese. Uh, <laughs> So he he did have an automobile for a while. Interesting, okay. Uh, whereas Lewis never learned to drive. He always had a driver. So they get on the train. They get to this country. Some people think, oh, this is heaven. But you have to notice that Parrish still has a limp. And uh, yeah. you have to notice that there's this is another stage of purgatory. Yeah. Even in Dante, mm. the early stages of purgatory are the most hellish. But as you mm-hmm. climb... Up, up Mount mountain. Purgatory, you actually get to the Garden of Earthly Delights. So you're getting close to paradise. Mm, gotcha. So now he's in a much better place. It's beautiful. They see the tree, the tree that he's been trying to draw his whole life. Mm-hmm. If you were a Platonist, you would say that here's this internal image of beauty. And Nigel always had intuitions of it. And as an artist, he's ch- simply trying to capture a glimpse of that beauty. Yeah. It was already there. Now, some critics believe that he actually created the tree, that his artistic work contributed to the beauty of the universe. And now part of the furniture of the afterlife will be the beautiful tree that Nigel imagined. Yeah, well, it's it really seems that way in the story because he says it, it wasn't just a tree, it was his tree. Right, yeah. And that he Nigel's actually, tree. of it, he says it's a gift. He was referring to his art and also the result, but he was using the word quite literally. And so he says all the leaves were there just as he had imagined them or rather as he had made them. And so it's, right. he seems to be stating very clearly that he made this tree, he saw it, and then as he was painting it, it was actually being made in the afterlife life or something which fits perfectly the idea of subcreation that this is his gift to god yeah he's going to contribute to beauty by creating beauty yeah although i love the uh the ambiguity of that phrase it's a gift because it's god's gift to him uh-huh. but the rewards of heaven are a gift but it's also his gift to god he created yeah. beauty but it also mm. ends up being a gift to everyone else who's on right. the way right to heaven because it becomes a stop on the train Yeah, there's another paper for you undergraduates. The line, it's a gift. Give me about eight to ten pages and (laughs) unpack that notion, all the dimensions of meaning to that one phrase. Yeah, definitely. Yes. And you get to the point, too, right after the phrase, it's a gift, um, and it says he was referring to his art and also to the result but he was also using the word quite literally, which is kind of like this story itself, which mm-hmm. I consider a gift. It's, yeah. It operates on many different levels. Yeah. But then in the next paragraph, it goes on to explain that the beauty was produced in collaboration with Mr. Parrish. Yeah, right. And that important point that we are all part of the body of Christ. Right. And this... This story has special meaning when you consider the context of high modernism, when Tolkien was writing, when the whole idea of great art is autonomous. You know, you just do, the great artist um, has just pursues his, and it was usually a his for Mm -hmm. high modernists, his own vision and um, 
pretty things and beauty. Oh, that's what the masses need. You yeah. know, we need abstract expressionism. I'm just expressing myself. Yeah. And I think Tolkien is kind of fighting against that, especially we mentioned earlier the line when he said he wished he could um, get paid. What was the pension? He the could pension, have a pension, a pension yeah. to be an artist. Well, in there were modernist artists that I'm sure disgusted Tolkien, who actually argued that they shouldn't have to fight in World War One because they're great artists. <laughs> you know, they shouldn't sully themselves mm-hmm. with what the masses need yeah. to do for the country. Well, he does take a swipe at modern critics. At when we were watching uh, Niggle and Parrish in Purgatory or on their way to heaven, in, on Earth they were both incomplete. Niggle mm. was so much into his art that he was in danger of neglecting his community duties. Right. Yeah. Whereas Parrish is so practical. He doesn't, yes. he doesn't, he doesn't see, see beauty, beauty when he's looking yeah. right at it. He just saw green and lines. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. He can't even see beauty. Right. Yeah. He, uh, yeah, it's nonsensical to him. Right. Mm-hmm. But as they uh, as they get further up in purgatory, it's they switch roles. Suddenly, Niggle gets more interested in keeping the garden, and uh, Parrish starts looking at the tree, and he just can't believe the beauty of the tree. Yes. So they're both becoming more complete individuals. Yes. But back on Earth, you mentioned the modernist. There's this funny section on the critics going, yeah. well, even if he did paint, he didn't paint the right kinds of things. They yeah. were very old-fashioned, and he's and clearly pretty. mocking. They're, yeah. they're mocking. Yeah. Counselor, Realism. Uh, Counselor Tompkins and Schoolmaster Atkins. Yeah, and, right. And one named Perkins. Yeah. And even the um, the rhyming of the names Tompkins, Atkins, Perkins. He's just kind of saying, yeah, they're all kind of the same, yeah. you know, like, dismissive. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and he says that, uh, they say about him that, you know, one of them says, well, I would have put him away, you know, or I would have tried to turn him into a serviceable cog. Right. Um, Uh. And there's a sense that there was no practical use to his painting. And then they actually say, oh, well, at least they were able to use that canvas with that tree painting to fix somebody's roof or something. You know, they were able to put it to good use as, as, you know, as if the painting itself was of no use. It was useless. Mm -hmm. But mm-hmm. then this one person looks at the corner of this one leaf <sighs> and goes, that is really a beautiful leaf. And so he cuts off the corner and frames it and puts it in a museum. And the happy ending would be, and then later on, everybody realized what a wonderful leaf it was. Yeah. yeah. And, goes, and later, recognized Nickel as a great artist. Yeah, a great That's genius. The- Happily ever after ending. Right. But no, the museum eventually burns down and the uh, the yeah. uh, the leaf <laughs> picture gets destroyed. Yeah, so he, on earth, everything is perishable. Everything yeah. is wood and uh, straw and ashes. What are those three things that all go away? I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> wood, <laughs> a- ashes, and old stray, compu- haw, and stray, straw, straw, hay, and stubble. Uh, that might be and, it. And taxes. And, yeah, and taxes. <laughs> and old computers. They, they, yeah. Anyway, but his art was perishable on earth, but in a sense, it was immortal or eternal in heaven because that tree would always be there. Yeah, well, it's it ends, he says, you know, the leaf and niggle were forgotten and his name was never mentioned again on earth. But right. then in eternity... This country that he and Parrish collaborate on building with this house and the garden and everything, it becomes Niggles Parish. Right. And yes. it's, the, it's the first stop on this train that's taking you to yeah. the mountains of heaven. Yeah, yeah, it didn't have a name, but they gave it a name. Yeah. yeah. And, Combining their two names, yeah. Niggles Parish. That's so brilliant. Yeah. So the two voices that had been critiquing Niggle when he was in the, the first stage of purgatory, the voice of justice and mercy are talking about mm-hmm. this area, which has now been settled. I think we shall have to give the region a name, said the first voice. What do you propose? The porter settled that some time ago, said the second voice. Train for Niggle's Parish in the Bay. He had shouted for a long while now. Niggle's Parish. I sent a message to both of them to tell them. What did they say? They both laughed, laughed till the mountains rang with it. So that's the end of the story when they discovered that their communal efforts or their shared efforts, which not only have rounded them both out as human beings, but they've actually created a region of heaven, which now other people can enjoy. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah. I also like in the story that it's clear that there's mountains that's further back beyond it. And eventually they, uh, they walk to the margins of Niggle's painting and they meet the shepherd Right, and he's their guide that's going to take them further on. And, uh, Parrish um, wants to wait for his wife. Uh, right. He's been waiting for his mm. wife to show up and so he can 
show her and, and uh, enjoy that with her and then move on, you know, eventually. So Nagel kind of journeys on by himself uh, towards the end of the story into the mountains. Which is a very similar image to what Lewis liked to use at oh, the end yeah. of Great Divorce and at the end of uh, The Last Battle. Yeah. Some critics think that Niggle and Parrish are actually two sides of the same person. Um. Rather than being the community imposing upon the artist, this is the person who wants to spend all his time on his art versus the person who realizes he needs to tend to his wife. He needs to tend to the community. Oh, so the two um, sides of Tolkien? Yeah, so mm, there's different ways to interpret those mm-hmm. two characters. Well, I think both are operative in right. good literature. So when we treat this as autobiography, it's the two sides of Tolkien. When we treat it as allegory, it's allegory of the body of Christ, where in right. 1 Corinthians 12, it says, can the ear say to the hand, I don't need you, yeah. and, and that we are all one in Christ Jesus, but we have different purposes yeah yeah definitely i i like there's one other thing i would have mentioned where he gets there and he's looking at the tree and he's you know noticing that all the curves of the landscape were just as he had imagined them but then he talks about the forest and he says the forest marched off into the distance Mm. and i love that little line just this handful of times where he uses a verb you know the forest marching Mm. that echoes you know the march of the uh, the ants and all that stuff from the Lord of the Rings, right? And then right. The, he also brings up this concept, which is very fascinating to me. Which kind of makes him, kind of makes you think that he was envisioning this when he was painting or drawing things. But this idea that you could walk into the forest, which was at a distance, without it actually becoming, you know, your surroundings. It still remained at a distance, uh, and that concept. Uh, he says. Um, He had never before been able to walk into the distance without turning it into mere surroundings. It really added a considerable attraction to walking into the country. Um, Mm. So I really liked his depiction of this uh, fanciful place where um, he could create things and actually build a world. And it wasn't just a painting. It was a real Mm. tree and but he could walk into the margins. I thought that was very fascinating. Once again, yeah, that sounds like Lewis says, we don't want to just look at beauty. We want to be a part of beauty. Yes. Participate in it. And further up, further in. Or farther up, further in. Yeah, there's always an infinite horizon. Right. Yeah, he says a further stage, another picture Mm -hmm. in the story. Mm -hmm. Right. And rather than this static, boring view of heaven, and I remember as a little girl saying, oh, "Mommy, what's heaven like?" And she says, "Oh, it's you pearly play gates, cloud, and you play a harp, and yeah, you... and streets of gold." And it just sounded incredibly boring. And <laughs> I think that is one of the po- many positive effects of both Tolkien and Lewis to create life with Christ sound incredibly exciting. Mm. It's just the forest keeps going. Yeah. And the further you go, the more beauty you see. And it's yeah. just never ending. Well, but now they also that have, is something worth looking forward to. Yeah, but they also have something to do, you know? So yes. he builds a house and they right. build a garden and he finishes the tree. And so they're actually creating in this place as well. But yeah, those things last, true. you know, they don't fall apart. Right. Crystal, your uh, idea about how boring heaven sounds reminds me of an analogy from Lewis. When it, somebody tells uh, a child that uh, sex is one of the most wonderful experiences you'll ever have, and the child says, well, does it involve eating chocolate? <laughs> well, no, it doesn't involve eating chocolate. <laughs> well, then how could it be that wonderful? So that's kind of the way we are about heaven. It's kind of like, well, does it fit our idea of pleasure or yeah. wonder or joy? Yeah. And yeah. if it doesn't fit it, then we can't quite imagine what it is. Right. Yeah. I wanted to throw in a story that George Sayer tells. He was a friend of both Lewis and Tolkien. He's the one who got out a tape recorder, and we have these famous uh, recordings of Tolkien reading from Lord of the Rings. Oh, really? He later became uh, one of the best biographers of C.S. Lewis. Yeah. yeah, that's something if you come to the wage, you can listen to the recordings of Tolkien. Uh, reading from Lord of the Rings, right. Well, George Sayer said that the two Lewis brothers, Jack and Warren, were going off on a walking tour with Tolkien. But they were much more destination-oriented, so they would like the tree and the flowers and the view, but they wanted to get to the next pub by lunch, and then they wanted to get somewhere (laughs) Mm -hmm. in order to board for the evening. And uh, Tolkien, the hiker, was just like Tolkien, the artist. He would stop and say, do you know what this flower is called? And he would go into the 
the derivation of that flower. Oh, wow. And then he would stop and say, see this tree? It's really unusual this tree is growing here because normally willows don't like to grow too far away from them. And they said he was such a dilatory walker, they finally dropped him off at George Sayers house in Malvern (laughs) And said, could you entertain toddlers for a few days while Warren and I continue our walking tour? So basically, <laughs> they dropped him off. And he was he was amenable. He thought that was fine. He, he thought they marched too much like people in the army. He, they were always trying oh, to get wow. somewhere. Yeah. Whereas he wanted yeah. it to be a day hike. He didn't want it to be a march. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's kind of like when you and I take walks. <laughs> yeah. Chris, Crystal is very goal oriented. I actually start making up excuses. I go, excuse me, I have a rock in my shoe. Oh, look at this little flower. Come look at this flower. I make up reason. Yeah, I'm much more like Tolkien and you're more like the, the Lewis brothers wanting to march ahead. So anyway, he dropped off uh, Toller's at the Sayers, they dropped him off at George Sayers' house. And he said, you know, it's such a beautiful day. I would like to get outside. Do you mind if I uh, just take some of your yard tools, go do some yard work and some gardening? And uh, George said, oh, I'd love that, please. So he got out his yard tools for uh, Tolkien to use. And after about an hour or so, he went and checked on him. And he said there was this one little tiny corner of the yard where he had trimmed all the grass totally evenly And he found a rose bush and he just clipped it exactly right. Oh, wow. But in an hour, he'd really covered just very small corner of the whole lawn. It's like nickel. Yeah. And he said, oh, yes, this is someone who loves attention to detail. Yeah. So it's funny how your personality expresses itself in all sorts of different ways. Right. Right. And unlike Niggle, Tolkien's works are still being read and appreciated and uh, drawing incredible interest. Well, he wrote this, this was published in 45, so The Hobbit was out, but nobody knew about Lord of the Rings. Mm. And he might have thought, well, I have one little leaf, I have The Hobbit, and that may have a certain value, but by the time I die, it'll probably be forgotten. Oh, wow. You don't want to push allegory too hard. Right, yeah. But he might have been thinking his one little leaf that someone appreciated was the Hobbit, but oh, nobody wow. knew about the tree. But he nobody was kn- he was working on the Lord of the Rings during during this. He time. was, yeah. He by fits and starts. He started right after the Hobbit became successful, probably December thirty seven. He didn't finish it till forty eight. Yeah, which is several years after this story was written. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then it took him another seven years to get it into print. Wow. Mm. Uh, so I'm sure he felt a lot like Niggle that his work was probably going to end up being a private hobby and oh. people would only see one small mm-hmm. corner of his legendarium and that it would be it may it may just be forgotten someday yeah. right yeah wow. burned down so, yeah. so far both he and lewis proved to be bad prophets uh, <laughs> lewis thought that his works would be forgotten after he died and he actually worried about his brother warren being able to live on his army pension oh, without wow. any royalties uh-huh. going to don't worry about it, Jack. He'll he'll do fine. Yeah. He and his descendants will uh, do fine. Well, and there's irony, too, because one of the rare items that we have at the Wade is a first edition of The Hobbit, and it was in a warehouse that was bombed during World War II. Oh, wow. So most of those editions, the first edition of The Hobbit, are destroyed. Oh, we wow. have one of the few that survived the bombing. Wow. We think the Nazis bombed that f- that particular factory on purpose <laughs> to demoralize English and American <laughs> fans of Tolkien. So it, it almost is like the story almost yeah. came true wow. with a Nazi bomb. But of course... Tolkien kept working yeah. and working, and that is what our subsequent podcast will yeah. be about, the incredible leaves that we call the Lord of the Rings. We'll see you then. The Wade Center podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to The Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, fast collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. 
To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.